So, I'm Howard Berger. This is Marshall Julius. Hey everyone. Although for some reason people forget like Marshall and they just call him Julius. We get like all these emails like, hey Julius, and it's like like his changed his name to Captain or something like Captain Julius. But yeah. Actually, sure my name is Kirst. It is because I have a first name for a surname and a surname. There for you a first go. Name. So we might change it to Julius Marshall, but we're seeing. Um, anyhow, Andy, thank you very very much. And Andy is. Uh, you know, worked with K and B for many, many years, doing a lot of stuff. And yes, Tammy and I, Tammy Lane's here tonight as well, which is great. Um, so yes, we do. We I think we were sitting. God, I don't. I think where were we? Oh, we might have been at Richard Taylor's house. And then Andy called and went, "Hey, guess what? Turn on the news." I'm like, "Richard, can you turn that on?" And there, there was all of the studio on fire. I'm like, "Okay, did you get the bodies out?" So, um, so yeah, it was all crazy. Um, hey, thank you for coming. This is great, we're really excited. So Marshall and I, uh, we wrote a book um, called Masters of Makeup Effects. And um, really what it was about is, is, is that years and years ago, 16 years ago, well why don't you tell the story? 16 years ago, what did we do? 16 years ago, Howard came to uh, London to promote The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. And um, I was sent there by the uh, Sunday Express to interview him. And he made me up as Mr. Tumnus. And in between the interview and Mr. the, it was the last time I had hair, which was amazing. <laughs> the ears are only slightly bigger than my usual ears. But in between the, the 10 extra minutes that we had to just talk about stuff, we talked about monsters and movies, and actually the same thing that we've talked about ever since, that you talk with everybody. And uh, we just found some common ground. And Howard made the terrible mistake of saying, yeah, here's my email address, and it's like, just drop me a line, and so it's like, you know, a week later, it's like, hey, can I interview you again for this thing? And, and then we just kind of struck up a friendship. And, um, and then after about three or four years, we just were talking about movie books and um, sort of things that we love and how cool it would be to write a book together. And um, and so, you know, I immediately was like, okay, so are we, are we doing it now? And I was like, well, you know, I've got to go off and do this, you know, this huge movie that's going to win another Oscar. Or it's, you know, I'm going to work with these huge movie stars. And what could I say? It's like, come on. I want you to spend two years in front of your computer not going anywhere, which is like a writer's life. So it took 10 years to pin him down. And every six months I'd be like, hey Howard, should we do it? Should we do the book now? But then when the pandemic hit, <laughs> and uh, it was like, I, I, I emailed him, I said, I bet you're free now. I know you're stuck at home. You're not going to see Mark Wahlberg. You're not doing anything. It's like, so, um, you know, let's take advantage of this wonderful time and to start working on the book. Howard agreed immediately, and we spent every day for the next two years working on it. I mean, pretty much, yeah. like immediately that day, um, like an hour after we had that conversation, Howard was already emailing me lists of uh, people that we should speak to, and we're thinking of chapter titles, and it was, it was just the most amazing experience ever. It was so fun. I mean, it, never mind getting us through the, uh, the pandemic, which is a great time to interview everybody as well, because nobody was working. So it's like, I've, I've written books, you know, as a journalist, as myself, just by myself, and it's like, uh, oh yeah, I want to get, this is my wish list of interviews, and it's like, oh yeah, you're not going to get that person, that person not going to reply you. But Howard, he's like, hey, Rick Baker, you know, you want to talk tomorrow? And he's like, yeah, sure, Howard. And it's like another world. It's, it's just amazing, the sort of access that Howard, um, got us for the book and uh, hope that we've reflected that in the pages. So one of the reasons I wanted to do a book like this was a book called Making a Monster that came out in the 80s that I love. And I loved it when I was a kid and I love it now. And I always wish that they would do like a, a, a follow up, like a volume two, and they never did. But I thought, hey, that's, why don't we use that as a leaping off point? And instead of each chapter being about a makeup artist, like this uh, chapter's about Tammy Lane or this chapter's about, you know, Michael S. Deke. Um, it would be spread out, you know, and so we decided on all the different chapters and interviewed a whole bunch, we interviewed 70 people, about 70 people, and not just makeup effects people, but there's makeup effects people, there's directors, there's actors, there's VFX supervisors, there's film editors, um, so we really kind of like threw a very wide net, because I wanted to hear what, what they had to say, you know. So in interviewing people, we, we backed it up from when we had to deliver the book to, you know, when I had to end the interviews, and granted, there's a ton of people we didn't get to interview, like Andy Schoenberg, but he will be in volume two. Um, and uh, um, that we could only have, we only had four months to interview all these people, 70 people, so we tried to do 
one, at least one a week, you know? Um, so it would have been tough though if we'd interview yeah. more people, just finding room for them because we only had a, a set number of words. So it's like, you know, every person meant that everybody else lost like, you know, 50 words or something. So right. we and really packed in yeah. as many All the words were super important. So once, once we figured all that out, then I reached out to everybody and I said, okay, now I need photos, you know? Because I also wanted to make sure that all the photos in the book are not really the photos you've seen before, you know? Like, you go to a, a, a bookstore and you look at like, you know, 100 years of Universal Monsters and it's all the stuff you've seen a million times, you know? So I asked everybody to, to dig deep and send me cool stuff from like when they were a kid uh, to, you know, things they felt comfortable based on what their involvement was uh, in, the, in the book and in the chapter. So we got some really great stuff. In all, there's a thousand photos in the book. I collected 4,000 <laughs> photos, so there's enough for three more books. Um, and uh, I think we collected hundreds of thousands of words, and we've narrowed it down to 70,000 words in the book. But it's a really cool book. Um, I'm super proud of it. It's exactly what I wanted. You know, I, I love like getting a great book and uh, laying down on the on your bed, you know, and you just you're leafing through it, and you're like, this is so cool. The other thing too is, and this is for all of you since you're all artists, I find that all of us have learning disabilities and have dyslexia. I have dyslexia terribly. And uh, I wanted to make sure that the print in the book was easy to read, that I wouldn't have a problem reading it, um, that it was spaced out, it was large enough, and that was really a big directive I had for the um, editor and for the publishers, because I'm like, half the times I'm looking at stuff, I can't, I'm like, I can't read this. War and Peace, pff, I'll wait for the movie. So, um, <laughs> but uh, I, we wanted to make sure that it was a fun book to read and it was easy to read, you know? Because again, I do believe as artists and uh, the whole art community has serious learning disabilities, which by the way, I'm, I'm very proud of having that, um, because that means I guess I'm pretty good at what I do. Uh, and and um, we compensate with being artists, you know? We're visual people, you know? I mean, there isn't any homework I have from being, when I was a kid, that doesn't have monster shit drawn all over it. And of course it has a big F, but there's great Frankenstein monster drawings on it. <laughs> or Planet of the Apes, and I'm like, but this, doesn't this count, you know? Um, and I think my mom had said, is there any homework that doesn't have doodles on it? And I'm like, no, none. So, um, but yeah, it's, I think it's a fun book. It's really cool. Um, you know, in interviewing everybody, like there's people we interviewed that I've known for 30, 40 years. And doing these interviews, I learned a lot of new things about different people that I, I never knew about, you know. And saw people in different light, you know. And everybody was so uh, obliging and supportive of the project, which was great. And like Marshall said, everyone we called uh, and invited was, was uh, wanted to do it, you know, was full in. And even though I bugged the crap out of them about photos and you know, signings and all that stuff. Tammy Lane has been so great She's coming to everything, so. Um, Promise dinner. Yeah, and I said I'd buy her dinner. <laughs> I'd buy her a couple drinks, she'd be fine. So, um, but you know, and, and it's also, it's what I like about this book, it's not, it's not a how-to book. You're not gonna learn how to glue down appliance or how to use Pax Paint. Those are already out there. Mike Spatola has written many of those books. So I didn't want to do a how-to book. And also, it's not a, about a singular person. It's, it's about the community. And that was really, really important to me. And it, and it ranges from all, like I said, all different departments. But also, you know, I was lucky enough to have Leonard Engelman, who's right over there, involved. And Leonard was able to bestow, I mean, he has a massive career with amazing things. Things that influenced me, like Cat People, is one of my all-time favorite films. Like, I love that movie. And Leonard gave me great access to a bunch of photos I'd never seen before, especially the Polaroid. I love that Polaroid of you um, with Nastasha Kinski and the hairdresser who just passed away. Uh, jo is it Joanne or... Anyhow, she, um, I'll, I'll think about it, uh, but it, it's a great Polaroid. And I'm like, that's a moment in history. Leonard there with Nastasha Kinski and she's being made up in her prosthetic makeup. And that's like things you don't get to see. And um, I was overjoyed with it also. But I mean, so many great people and it's really, really fun. I hope like when you guys read the book and look through it, you get a lot out of it. I think it's a great oral history. It's, it's right, you know, it's not me and, uh, and Marshall telling these stories. They're, these Everybody we interviewed is telling the story. So it's really all first person, which is so cool. Um, it's, yeah, there's very little, we, actually we don't do any observation at all, we just listen, you know. Um, we just wanted it all to come from the stories. Yeah, we wanted, it, and it is all about stories. I love stories. 
Like I love telling stories, I love hearing stories. I'll go, you know, whenever I've been on set, you know, I remember working on a, uh, a movie called City Slicker, and there was this wrangler named Jack Lilly. Did you know Jack Lilly, a wrangler? He'd been working with John Wayne, like he, stunt, he was the stunt guy. Uh, you knew Jack Lilly, didn't you? No, Jack Lilly. Uh, <laughs> um, and he was like, he, he was the stunt man for John Wayne and Stagecoach, but he was a wrangler. I don't know if he's still around. But he would sit around and tell these stories, and I just absorb them and just love them. And anytime I can hear stories from people, it's amazing. And Leonard has told me great stories. And, um, and I wanted awesome. these stories to be in this book. Yeah, I mean, Howard is like a, just an encyclopedia of amazing stories. And so you just, and everybody tells great stories when they get together, that's what they trade. And it's yeah. the, the whole history is like an oral history. And, and people don't say, you know, in 1924, this happened and this was developed. Everybody's talking about all the crazy stuff they did and mm -hmm. people they work with. And so I just thought if we could write a book that captures that, what it's like to just hang out and chat with these people. When yeah. And then like as friends, as opposed to doing these sort of official interviews where everybody's you know, a little bit guarded, and like nobody was guarded because we had these two hour interviews and uh, they would just talk about stuff Everything, for the yeah. first like hour and so, so they were all relaxed, then we'd sneak a few questions in and you know, it just, it all came together yeah. really well. No, it's, it was, it's great, so I hope you all like the book when you read it and look at all the cool photos and all that good stuff. Um, so today, what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna do a makeup demo. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> you shut up down there, so. I'm making, I'm making it really easy on myself, too, because it's just a two-piece, so, and I pre-painted it all, like, hey, look, it's all, a ball, yeah, it's a perfect I know, story. I'm like, no challenge. Yeah, this guy's no challenge, yeah. So, uh, but I'll just, I'll talk through it, and we'll, you know, do that, but um, before we start, and I'll take questions during doing the makeup, whatever you guys want to ask, feel free. Uh, before we start, do you guys have any questions you want to ask us before we start about anything whatsoever? Anything. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good question. So the question is, you know, what was our thought process to make this all come together? And it really was just to create something that one we'd be proud of, that everybody would like, that can also be educational but fun, you know. And I feel like. Um, you know, we, Marshall and I, like he said, we talked every single day for two years and figured it all out and writing and writing and writing. And, and it's hard to write a book. I actually, you know, I thought it might be a little easier. It was a pain. And very difficult. just working with me. Yeah, working with him. No, Especially no, but there's so easier. much to do and so, you know. And then, you know, then once you kind of write it, then you have to find a publisher. And that was really hard, too. That was equal. Like, we had four months to write this book and we took four months to get a publisher. And some yeah, people, I thought that was going to be a lot easier. Yeah, I was like, oh, I yeah, thought sure, I would just throw your name around. And yeah, stuff that didn't mean jack shit. So. Yeah, you know, with the pandemic, everybody was so afraid yeah, to spend like, money. What? And it was like, don't you understand? This is going to be the greatest film book ever. <laughs> and it's like they just thought that yeah. I was bullshitting. But it, it yes, yeah, it turned out pretty good. Uh, so yeah, so it just was kind of figuring out what we liked, what we didn't like. You know, went through a bunch of names. Went, I mean, names of the book. Went through a bunch of chapters. How, you know, there were way more chapters. Like originally, we had 25 chapters narrowed down to 15 yeah. and uh, you know talked about who was going to be in the book and all that good stuff so um, yeah it's a huge process it, it, it's you know if we do a second one which we're hoping to at least we know what we're in for you know and hopefully we don't have to hunt for a new uh, publisher so I don't think we will no. but because uh, the book's doing very well which is nice so. yeah the important thing that it wasn't just a linear history right but by the time you get to the end of it just sort of by accident you've got the the whole history of everything in your head just in a more conversational way so I think yeah. that uh, yeah, yeah we achieved it anybody else have any other questions before yes um, I have a a comment okay okay but I've been reading the book already and I I appreciate a lot that it is like that. It's very familiar, and it even feels like you're talking yes. kind of to these people. So I, while I was reading it, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember I did this kind of thing too when I was little. Yeah. Really familiar, it's like friendly. Cool. Like a lot of people are going to be able to just look at it and it's really cool. Right. Yeah, I hope so. So, no, thank you. Those are, that's very, very nice of you. So, yeah, we wanted it to feel familiar and, and easy, you know? Yeah, it's it's like, like us, right? you know, not everybody likes to read. 
you know, I love looking at pictures mostly, at, you know, like, just, you know, you get a book and you go right to the center, like, there better be pictures in this book. <laughs> like, oh, good, there's, yeah. there's no pictures in this, <laughs> I'm fine, I'll wait for the movie. <laughs> if we could actually come up with a sort of coffee table book where people yeah. would actually read the words as well as look at the pictures, yeah. that's <laughs> that's, a, that's a plus. Right? I know. Well, I, yeah. I've got a lot of journalists that write to friends who, who write a lot of cash grab books and they say, oh, you know, we're going to do a history of Hammer or and it's like, uh, how long did it take? And they said, uh, oh, well, we did it in six weeks. They got a bunch of library pictures and just yeah. threw it out. And it's yeah, like, wait. so Marshall, how long did your book with Hammer take? Oh, about two years. Yeah. But, you know, I think you can tell. I hope you can yeah. Because all of their books, I just looked at the pictures. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't. Th well, yeah. The question is, do I do I feel that? You know, there's there's been a lull, and now it's there's an upswing for practical. I don't think there's ever been a lull. There's might have been like a, a quick breath. And that breath came about when we all went to see Jurassic Park and sat in the movie theater and went, damn you, Andy. And went and just said, we're all, I remember sitting next to Shannon, and I just went, we're extinct. And, uh, um, and I was, we were like, okay. But then we came up with like, hey, you know what? The way to survive this is, and Greg Nicotero, who owns K&B with me, we both sat down and talked about it and said, we need to join. Like, not to do visual effects, but to see how we can work into this world. Like, what can we do for them, and what can they do for us? And we work together. And that's where things like films we worked on, like the Narnia films, like um, uh, Sin City, you know, and, and a million other movies that we've done, um, working hand in hand with VFX, and it's very, very important. Um, I think practical makeup uh, and ma or practical makeup effects will always be around. Uh, I'm not saying that because I do it, you know, because I'm not going to do it forever, you know, uh, but um, but it will have it will continue. So, but keep this in mind, especially as as you, as you students. So, in order to keep makeup effects moving forward, it doesn't have to do with the threat of uh, visual effects or this or that or what have you. It has to do with people that are interested that want to move on to take the baton. Okay, so like if it ends with us then that's that. But if it continues with you guys, that's what's important. And, and that's the future, you know? The future is you guys and anybody else that wants to do makeup effects. Now, what's important also is that in order to do makeup effects, you have to have people that work in your shop, you know? And these days, we're finding, and all the shop owners, because we all, we're all friends, that's the other thing too, we are all friends. So Legacy and you know, Alec Gillis' new company, Studio Gillis, and um, you know, Spectral and everybody, Autonomous, we're all really great friends. And we all talk. And we all talk about what we need in our shop and we're, you know, we're, what we're shy. And being able to know how to do mold work, know how to do seaming and patching, running silicone, running latex, running foam rubber, all that stuff, that is, that is the, the bone of makeup effects. Like, yes, sculpting, of course, is important, but you can't, but if you can have a great sculpture and, and a shit mold, and then it doesn't matter, because then your sculpture just went for nothing, right? But all of us started at, at the bottom. Tammy Lane, Mike Deke, myself, we all worked doing just shit work, you know? When I first worked at John Beekler's, that's where I met Mike Deke back in, uh, uh, it was in 1983. 83, Mikey and I, and Bill Butler and all those guys, and <clears throat> we ran polyfoam and latex. We cleaned molds. We, you know, goofed off in the parking lot and made movies during work hours. Um, but you know, same thing when Tammy Lane worked at K and B, she cleaned buckets. You know, but that's what you guys have to be ready to do. You you will be living in a in a in a. Um, it's unrealistic, guys, and I'm just going to say this: to think I'm going to get out of makeup school and I'm going to go sculpt. In, at k and I'm gonna go paint at Spectral Motion. Unless you are amazing, as unless you are as good as Norman Cabrera, and Steve Wang, and Dave Grasso, and Jeremy Aiello, and Mikey Rotz, you're gonna have a hard time, okay? Those are the guys, these guys that are amazing, that have been doing this for years and years and years and years, and are amazing at it. Those are the guys that are gonna be the sculptors and painters right now, all right? But it's important for you all to hone your skills and everything else shop related. Then also, at some point, if you decide 
to become a, you know, go work in the f industry and become a union makeup artist and become a department head. When you need stuff, you'll understand how it's made. So, you know, if you go, okay, I need, you know, these transfers, I'm gonna do them in silicone, da 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 da, you can call the shop like that's in Van Dyke, you know, or, or you know, Roland's place or whatever, and go, no, no, I need these, this, th you're speaking with education. You're speaking with information. Because believe me, we have all gotten calls from department heads who don't know their ass from a hole in the ground, and they're asking for all the wrong stuff. And it's just gonna become a mess on set, and then you get blamed for their mess. So, um, so I'm just saying, that's what's gonna keep the industry going. It's gonna be you guys learning how to do everything. And everything is important, everything. We can't do anything at K&B if we don't have mold makers, seamers and patchers, foam runners, silicone runners, people that know how to run polyfoam and latex. It all applies. There's a, it's not about the glory, trust me. This is not a glorious industry. It's not, but it's a super fun industry. And that's way more. There's no grass is greener on the other side. There's no brass ring, all right? Don't think like, oh, get this, this is, get that out of your mind. You're there to do a job and do the best job you can. That's what all of us have done. You know, everyone that's, you know, Andy, myself, like I said, anyone in here that's a makeup artist, you know, Leonard went through the apprenticeship program, you know, way back when, when he was a young, a young sprite lad. Um, so we all have that training. We all know, and that's what you have to do, and, and work together. You must work together. You can't, it's not a competition, okay? You're not, you're not on face-off, all right? What you're doing is you're working for real in the real world. No drama, don't create any issues, don't give your bosses any headaches or lawsuits, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and just be there and work together, and it's gonna be great. That's the only way this is gonna work. If you guys, being the next generation, don't do that, then guess what? Then when Mike retires, when I retire, Tammy's never retiring, Schoenberg retires, then that's, that's gonna be it. Because we are, we're getting to that point, in all seriousness. Like, I love what I do, but I don't know how much longer I'm gonna do it for. It's, I'm, you know, I'm getting a little tired after 40 years. So, but, uh, yeah, I'll write books and make sure Tammy stays in line. <laughs> yeah, put that, there's no, this is a dry trailer, young lady. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, whatever, Tammy ignores me. Says, He'll never find that drawer. <laughs> um, <laughs> which will happen once. I'm like, what's in here? You're like, you're not supposed to see that drawer. So anyhow, um, so there, that's my rant about that. But it's super, super important. I can't stress. And every time I talk to students, you know, and, they, and that question is asked, you know, like, oh, do you think the you know, makeup effects is gonna fall apart because of VFX? No, it's about the people that are coming in next. That's what's gonna determine the survival of what we do. It has nothing to do with VFX doesn't have anything to do with 4K, 8K, 3 million K. It has to do with the future of you guys. And if you do the job and you get out there and work your asses off and listen and learn, you'll be good and then you take it. Then you guys go. It's yours. Here, take it all now. Take it all now. So good question. Uh, uh, let's do one more question before I start gluing crap on him. <laughs> one more question around? Anybody, 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 anybody? Yes. Well, I, um, like Howard, I'm just a mad movie fan from birth, really, and just that was always what I was interested in. We weren't a very sporty family, so no, nobody ever watched football in our house or wrestling or whatever the hell else was on on Saturdays. And my mom was a huge movie fan. She used to show me all the old films. And uh, so I was not, like, by the time I was like five or six, I was already sort of nostalgic. And it's like, go and tell my friends about this latest Bob Hope film that I just saw on TV in the afternoon. And they're like, who's Bob Hope? And, and it was like, I suppose I just always came from a place of being a, a fan. And then I was lucky enough to sort of become like a, a professional fan. And from like 18, I went straight to work for, for a magazine. And they hired me as a classical music editor. And then within a few weeks they let me write about movies because I don't know shit about classical music um, but you know you just always say yes you know to get the first job so it worked out okay so I, I then I, I wrote a few movie books and I was just lucky enough to be on sort of the outskirts of this kind of world that I love so much you know how it's very much involved in creating everything I just wanted to be on the outside making sure that everybody went to see those films and enjoyed the right ones and just um, so I've written some books, but you know, it's, it's really hard getting, you know, getting a book to hit. 
and uh, publishers, especially, you know, with things what got digital for, for writers as well. It's like newspaper jobs went, you know, down the tubes, magazine jobs. It was really hard finding, you know, kind of get to get kind of paid for, for doing, you know, what I was doing because everybody was like, oh, we can do it for free. You know, we just want to write a bunch of SEO keywords. And, but, you know, I mean, eventually I was just held on and held on and just kept going and because it's, it's all I know, it's all I can do is sort of be a professional fan and, and writer and, and like I said, you know, Howard gave me his uh, email address and here we are 16 years later and uh, it was worth it, it was worth the wait and the, the work was amazing. It was so much fun doing it with Howard, much better than anything I've kind of worked on myself because it's pretty solitary being a writer and uh, it was nice to be able to go over everything and Howard and I are very detail oriented and we worked pretty damn hard and so you know we just sort of took it over. We were very lucky that our publishers uh, you know let us do everything. They didn't like Howard says our fingerprint is on like every page even if they would send us stuff and uh, we would like redesign every page um, even when they tried to edit the text just ed edited it back and just it's like no we know what we want we know what we're doing and uh, so I mean it was just the most incredibly satisfying experience and then it came out then it wasn't just like us it was like everybody and, and at the signing we had the other day people are coming up to us and I don't know if it's an American thing you're all so nice um, I just can't see we'll see if that happens in London but everyone's saying thank you so much for for doing this book and it's like everyone's excited to have it on their on their shelves in their collections and I honestly I'm just completely overwhelmed with it all so well why don't you grab the chair bring it up uh, paint. paint. <laughs> you saw that look like. Oh, yes, I know that. That's Very funny. Good. I was sure I pulled those paints out, but I guess I was I didn't. Like, the two I <laughs> yeah, I forgot paint, but that's okay. I can wing it. All right. And now how it's going to turn me into a big brain. Yeah. Okay. Mind. I'm gonna. We're gonna do a scavenger hunt. All right. Who's got? Who's got like a um, uh, PPI or you know Illustrator? Just like a red and like a blue and rice paper. Anybody have that in their kits? Yeah. Yeah. Go get it. Uh, right here. You got it here? No, okay, well that's that's like saying I sure would like Savini, remember? I sure wish I could have a sweatshirt. Oh I have one where? Back in the America. I'm like, what are you doing? Alright, anyhow, go ahead and take your glasses off, please. No. Yes. Okay, I'm completely airbrush. blind. No, I have air, I have air yeah, airbrush paints. I forgot them. Do I see that's not very you know I was so excited to see all of you, so yes. It's okay, I can wing it. I got rubber mask grease paint, we're fine. That's all I need is rubber mask grease paint. All right, so this is, this is a makeup that um, we did, Tam and I did for, first for Ted 2, which there's a scene in Ted 2 where they go to the Comic-Con, so we wanted to do a bunch of like crazy looking makeups and um, we did this big headed alien thing, so I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then of course when Tammy and I did our Orville, I'm like, hey, we can use that again. So we ran and we had a bunch of different things and at first it was like this, putting this makeup on another guy named Dirk Rogers, who's a suit performer, works at K&B. Tammy and I did this makeup on him for episode one and that was kind of the genesis for Dan. If you guys watch Orville, you guys watch Orville? Yeah. Orville, Orville, okay. So, all right, so this is Marshall. <laughs> nice, beautiful. I can't see anyone. I'm completely blind without my glasses on. So this is a bit like a nightmare. So you're standing up on stage in front of people. No, you can't hear you. Yeah, so now, now you can hear, which is perfect. So yeah, so this is just this is foam rubber, and um, I'm a big foam rubber fan. Actually, I think that there's a mistake when people. Uh, you know, think that because it's silicone is the newest thing. Silicone's the newest thing that that's what they should be using. That's not necessarily true. You have to look at what the re what you're doing. What's that makeup going to be? How's it going to be utilized? And you know, Andy can att uh, uh, attest to this on Walking Dead, like yeah. season one. The idea was, oh, those makeups, zombie makeups, we're going to do some silicone and all that. And I remember Greg saying, yeah, the guys put all the makeups on. Everyone went to set, and when the makeup artist showed up, all the makeups were on the ground. You know? So at that point, it was decided that it was mostly going to be foam rubber, right? Yeah. For the most part. Stay on better and you can do more. Yeah, I can do more with it and play around with it. The thing with silicone is, it's not really a generic material. If you do a big piece, it's kind of hard to massage, um, you know, those pieces and all that stuff. So, but with foam rubber, you can do a million things, which is so much fun. 
on Orville, you know, again, Tammy and I really talked a lot about how we were going to do that because it was pretty insane. Here, I'm going to give you this. Can you hold it? That's glue. Okay. So I'm just using um, uh, the uh, uh, EBA Zilla Bond. <laughs> and when I glue stuff down, I go, I just go big on it. Tammy always thinks like I just take a giant paintbrush and just go blub, blub, blub and slap it down. But I, I, I don't, uh, again, I think about how I'm going to do, how it's going to play, how long is it going to play, because I hate cleanup, and thank goodness they're going to clean up Marshall later. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, but I, you have to think about how, how long the, the day the makeup's going to play. It can be very short. Oh, cool. Ah, great. Thank you. Now, hey, look, I remembered my paints, Tammy. <laughs> thank you. So I did remember the airbrush. You didn't tell me to bring my kit. Yeah, like, I know. I'm, I thought I had it. I guess I was. I could paint it. I was like, oh shit! I didn't put those anywhere. Um, everyone just close your eyes. So I'll I'll take a look and see what you know. Like sometimes I'm using Orville as a point of reference. We'll have a guy in. He's just going to play in one scene. So Tammy and I will sit there and go, listen, just let's knock this out. Glue. It's only in this one scene. It's probably going to be two hours. But we don't need to make it bulletproof or else it's going to be a living hell. So, But then we have guys like Bordis, played by Peter Macon, that Tammy did for season three. Um, and we really glued the crap out of him. So, because he had to play all day long. And he sweats a little bit. He sweats around the face, neck, chest, breast area. Um, let's get some powder. So yeah, what I like to do is I, I put down the piece, as you can see. Um, and just glue down where I feel like it needs to glue down, like I stated. Once it tacks down, which I really like this stuff a lot, I'll go over the edge, and then I'll powder that down. <clears throat> Way back when, in the good old days, there used to be an adhesive called 355, and some of us still have some, but uh, um, that stuff was the best. And you could go in and glue down an edge like this, the thing is it kicked off really, really fast. Like the second you put it down, if you didn't put your piece down, it was like too late. But we would go ahead and put it over the edge and then powder it, and it would almost act like, you know, like mortar, you know, like you're filling in cracks or something, or like caulking or what have you. And it was really, really, really good. So I, I still use that technique where I'll put a little glue down. Keep your eyes closed. Just like that. And I'll hit it with a little powder before it dries. It just kind of helps set it and fill in the blanks there. There's going to be another piece I'm going to put on, Marshall. Walking around you. What's that? Uh, this is a Syllabon, made by EBA. And there's different glues. I mean, some people like the Telesis. Uh, you know, it's, <clears throat> I always say, I mean, listen, everybody will, yeah, that's really fun. Stuff. So there's a hundred ways to make a hamburger, as long as at the end of the day it's a hamburger. So you can use whatever you want, like when we, do a show, and you can tell you this, you know, I'll say in the morning, hey Andy, this is going to be the makeup, here are the appliances, here's the color scheme. And then Andy will start applying it. However he feels best to apply his makeup, that's it. I'm not going to sit there, we're not going to sit there and go, oh no, no, right here, this needs to be like that, and this needs to be that. Like Andy's a professional makeup artist, so he knows how to put stuff down, you know? So hopefully when you guys get out and if you're doing makeups, your department head will basically plant the seed. You know, and not sit there and micromanage it. Because that always sucks. I never use it like that. I'll take direction perfectly fine, but I don't want to be micromanaged. It's like, yes, I know. Yes, I have to glue it down with, with glue. I have to use it. Like, but there are those that do that. Yeah, it's, it's really annoying. Just nudge me if I fall this. Yes, if you, if you fall. <laughs> so I'm just going to go around and do all this. Does anybody have any questions while I'm doing this? Yes. Is this first time being Well, this, yeah, this is, yeah, it is. It's right, yes. Well, this after is. Mr. Thomas. Oh, yeah, yeah, that really was, that was, that was minimal. So, yes, that was a, yeah, nose and a headpiece. So, head piece. I will say, yes, it is. Um, Nondescript blur <laughs> over there. <laughs> yes. Now, the other thing, too, is I know when you guys have your finals, you have a lot of time to do it in. But remember, when you're in the real world, you don't. And um, for instance, on Orville, the time frame is a half, an hour and a half for all makeups. That's it. 
that's all we that's all we allow for. If you can't do it in an hour and a half, that's a bit of a problem. Sometimes your character won't make it to set. And we've had that too, where we've had uh, makeup artists that just can't seem to get their makeup under three and a half hours. <laughs> and it's like, well, you might as well take him out because he's not going to set for the day. They already shot that scene. So that's unfortunate. When you're working for people on set, that's one thing you must be very, very, very aware of is the time limitation. I know uh, James McKinnon's the same way on, on Star Trek Discovery. He's very, very specific about uh, time frame because everything is worked out per the shooting schedule. So, you know, at, at times, I think I came here a long, long time ago and they were doing finals and people had, like, I said, how long, is, how long do they have to do the finals? I said, oh, like six, seven hours. And I'm like, it should be an hour and a half and then you ask them every 10 minutes, how much longer? And just keep coming in, how much longer? How much longer? How much longer? And then you're gonna really learn fast. Oh, they need you on set. Can we get, how much longer? And have your model just keep like looking at his phone, looking around, looking down like this. There's um, a great makeup artist named Todd McIntosh. You guys know Todd McIntosh? Okay. And Todd is somehow notorious for getting actresses who just don't respect his, just respect him. And he sent, he sent me photos recently on a show and literally he's doing touch-ups and the actress is like this and he's down like this doing eyelashes. <laughs> and her head is like in her lap. And it's a big, big actress. And I'm like, why did you smack her in the face? You know, or just like not do it, or go to set. It's like, oh, Howard, you know I can't do that. So, um, but yeah, very, very funny and horrible at the same time. But yeah, it's, it's a really, you know, you gotta be on the point for that. Yes? Um, I know this is something that probably helped with like just experience of being on set, but do you have any advice for how to speed up your application process or data process? Uh, oh, in terms of application? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yes, absolutely. Look at the big picture, all right? When you have a time frame, if I say, okay, you have an hour and a half to do this makeup, then plan on it. Like, you get the makeup glued down in X amount of time. Like, you know, I've, Tammy and I, <laughs> we've done giant prosthetic makeups in like 10 minutes. I'm like, oh shit. There was one night on Orville, we did a full makeup on this guy all day long, for Brosk, yeah. and they wrapped him. And then they went, oh shit. He was clean, he was walking out the door. Isopropyl Maristate on him and everything. Oh, and Seth McFarland came and he was like, I have like two more shots of him. And he would have to come back tomorrow, but he can't come back tomorrow. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, fine, fine, get in the chair. I'm like, Tam, over here now. And we literally redid the entire makeup that took an hour and a half, hands, everything, in, in like 10, 20 minutes. Got him to set, did the two shots, and no one ever said thank you. <laughs> Except the actor. Yeah, the next time I'm like, hey, why is it taking two hours? This should take 10 minutes. Yeah. That was the curse of Face Off for a little bit. People would, like, we'd, I'd have meetings, they're like, well, I watch Face Off, and they do that really fast. I'm like, then why don't you go hire people from Face Off? That's fine. <laughs> All right, this is just like a little blender piece. So sometimes your edges are kind of, but I just thought I would, these edges are actually pretty good on this ball cap. Good. Yeah, and you're done. Go to set. <laughs> I also like the Silibon because it, it doesn't kick so really fast. It gives me a little time to to finesse a bit, to massage, as we say. I guess if you had to keep it in right, the right time. Yeah, if you don't. Yeah, time. yeah. If you can't lay you can't it, get it right the first if you don't get it right the first time, there's plenty so of time to do it. That's right. <laughs> Just ask Tammy Lane. Oh, so, to, I'm sorry, to finish answering your question, it's really about budgeting your time, you know? It's like, get it glued down, and then start painting. You know, people, I've had people in a trailer, um, like, literally spend, like, an hour gluing it down, and then they have, like, less than 30 minutes to paint it. And they're like, oh, I'm not going to finish it. I have to do hands, too. I'm like, that's part of, like, okay, I'll, I'll knock this down. And get, just go for it. Use a big brush, glue it down. It's good. You don't need this little teeny brush, right? Like, I've seen people like, I'm like, what are you doing? Just put glue all over it. For God's sakes. So, but yeah, just, just be brave. Go for it. What's the worst case? You screw it up. If you screw it up, you go back and do it again. There's plenty of times. I think there was one time Tammy and I, everything's Tammy and I. For some reason, Tammy and I worked together a lot. It's actually been like 28 years from when I first met Tammy, when she was just a young Sprite chicken. And she came to the shop, and then we've worked on everything. We've worked on more movies than 
you know, I've seen with my, my wife. <laughs> and, um, and so Tammy and I have a, a language, and that's another great thing too, this is part of working together as a partnership and a collaboration. Tammy and I have this dance we do it's not literally like a robot, uh, but it's we don't we don't talk while we're doing the makeup, but we know exactly what we need to do. It's just it's just natural. She knows. I'm like ready, go. I'm always on this side. Here, actually, come on. See. <laughs> I, I had to pick up the lanes in here. Grab a brush. You do that side, I'll do this side. You're running out of time, right? No. Quick, oh god damn, we gotta get this to set. Hey, yeah, I'm just wondering how long, I mean, that ship's gonna fly. No. But this will show you actually a little bit of teamwork. Yeah, well, I haven't glued that down yet. Okay. Shut up! All right, go sit down. <laughs> it's also always fun to do a makeup with somebody that you really enjoy working with, like Tam. And someone you trust. And that's the thing, like now, when Tammy and I do shows together, like we just finished Interview with a Vampire, which comes out in the next week. Uh, so make sure you watch it the week after. And uh, Tammy uh, and I started that show together as co-department heads. She was, Tammy was my co-department head, I was department heading it. And then I, uh, I ended up leaving the show early and Tammy took over. And I always trust Tammy a thousand percent. I know that Tammy will always have my best interest and the film's best interest and k and best interest, always. And she will always look after everything and make sure everything is perfect in every way, and it is. It's always perfect. And it's really just great, it's great. And also, you know, for Tammy to, though Tammy's done department head work, now she's gonna start doing more and more and more, you know? And that's about gaining your credits, getting more credits as a department head. But I, you know, and, and, it's, and it's really, I hate to say it, there aren't a lot of people that I trust in our business that I would ever send a set and let them just run the show. I mean, granted, Tammy and I talked every single day, privy to everything. You know, she always made sure I knew everything that was going on, because a lot of it... Almost everything. Almost everything. Yeah, there's probably a couple things. A couple things. When that trailer came back, I found some pretty bad stuff. No, uh, but, um, there's powder. I was on Mayfair, I wasn't... Oh, that's right, never mind. Uh, but yeah, it's about trusting the people you work with. You know, you have to. I trust Tammy a thousand percent. Probably more than I trust anybody. So, more than my wife. <laughs> it's true, and she, my wife knows, she's like, I know you trust Tammy more. I went, that is a hundred percent true. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, Tammy. Yeah, yeah. It's great to have somebody in your life like that. And it's, it's, a, it's a great working, uh, working relationship and great friendship. And, and it's the thing too, like Tammy and I, we have a great working uh, working relationship and great friendship. And it's the thing too, like Tammy, we're working together, when we're working together, you know, we're best friends, but there's also, we both know that when we're at work, it's, it's a working relationship, you know? If she's not happy with me about something, which of course never happens, uh, <laughs> or vice versa, which actually that never happens, um, we will have the conversation, you know? And you just be honest with each other, with every, you know, whomever you're working with. It's, it's great, but yeah, you have to learn to separate the friendship from the business. When you're working, it's, you know, you're working towards a common goal, which is to do the best work you can and give the, uh, give the director what he wants, you know, his, his vision. The vision, yeah, we've heard that. But my vision is, and I'm like, I don't know what your vision is. <laughs> <laughs> Movie magic. So I got really lucky because I came out, I fell into this because I panicked because I was going to be a graphic designer and move to Chicago and like live in Lincoln Park and like run on the beach and like, you know, that was going to be my life. I grew up near there and then uh, I discovered that I hated computers and this was <laughs> halfway through my senior year first semester I had a panic attack and uh, I uh, was talking to a friend one night. We're out of the bar in Desperados. It was Wednesday, ladies' night, 85 cent drafts. <laughs> <laughs> and she told me about this class through the university that went out to Los Angeles. And she goes, well, you like monsters, right? That's like, you know, that's what, you know, you're into. Because I did haunted houses and community, th community theater and stuff like that, painted sets. So I was, I grew up in around theater. My, my mom took me to musicals as, you know, since I was little. But um, she told me about this class to learn about the 
movie industry, like all aspects. And one of the things that was on the docket was to tour a makeup effects studio. And I didn't even know those existed at, the, at that time. I didn't even know what that was, because I grew up in Illinois, so I didn't know. And um, anyway, long story short, uh, I actually got into this class that she was talking about. And they were touring uh, K&B Effects. And that was the makeup effects studio, and that's how I met Howard, was through that class. And, the, and re really, the only reason I wanted to go was I wasn't even seriously thinking about moving to Los Angeles. I just uh, thought I'd never seen the ocean before. I was 21 years old, and I'd never seen the ocean. And I thought, oh, it would be just like a fun little trip. And uh, it changed my life. By the way, just real quick, this is um, Prose. Uh, it this, looks like beta No, it's not. It's mm. rosé, which and I just got some of <laughs> But I'll get, I'll get you a new shirt, Marshall. I know where to get those. Um, so, uh, no, what I like to do for foam rubber, I like to use rosé. But for uh, silicone, I use beta bond. And there's just something about the beta bond I like better on the silicone. I find the rosé on silicone appliances, it gets um, sticky and gooey, where the beta bond has like a vinyl in it. And I just find that works better and it blends really, really well. Really well from the skin to the, to the silicone piece. Um, the encapsulator, you know, I think, I'm done, has something similar, uh, you know, uh, base to it. But um, yeah, for, for foam, I like to use Beta Bond. Also, I don't, I'm not big on gluing pieces down with um, Prosate. I know some people will like cover the inside and then cover the face and then one, two, three. Um, that makes it really, really bulletproof, and uh, that's great, and there's people that love doing it, and I appreciate that. I don't, uh, so I like to use the silicone adhesive, uh, and then, and then um, hit it with uh, prosade as far as the edges go, so I think that works out pretty well. Pretty, pretty, pretty well. Any other questions? Questions? Uh, well, <laughs> all right. Yes, you may ask Cammy a question. Um, how is it being a woman in the SFX world? Like, oh. do you feel like you have to come? Listen, I'll answer that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Remember, men have balls in their boobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean. <laughs> Uh, when I was coming up, I, there was, I believe, around 40 men working at K&B when I first started, and I was the only female working in, in the studio at the time that wasn't working the front desk. So that had its advantages, but it also had its disadvantages, in, in a sense. Um, but the thing was is, you know, the, the guys were really friendly, like, this was 1996. Uh, and uh, I had no idea all the nasty things they were saying behind my back. <laughs> uh, no, not to say that, but, uh, but you know, being a female, you just, you know, you, you just have to, like, play with the boys. Like, if you, when you're growing up and you're riding bikes and you build ramps and you want to you wanna try to beat the guy that went off the ramp, you just, you know, you're willing to scrape up your knees and you know, and earn the respect of your of your peers, and and uh, and have respect for them, and, and uh, not use being a female as an excuse all the time about oh I'm a girl and it's a man's world. And it is, I'll be honest with you, it is tough, and I've had a lot of uh, instances, you know. But you know, learn a lot of practical jokes and fun <laughs> back. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I had this one uh, on. Uh, one guy was kind of doing me shit at one, you know, the first year that I started, you know, and started to give me a little, you know, whatever. So the next morning he found alginate all in his toolkit and he had to pick. <laughs> <laughs> saying is you play with the you know it is it can it's you know in the you're playing in the sandbox but 
that nobody should ever disrespect you. Yes. And, and if you have the proper employers, they will see that that never happens. And if that happens in the workplace, you speak up. Because what we don't want is to hear about it six months later and that this problem's been going on. And, and, if you have, and we are all responsible adult, adults, professionals, and oh, business owners. And if somebody ever disrespects you in a shop, you go, you go ahead and say something. Yeah. Because the consequence later will be much worse for you and for the shop and for the people that have been employing you. Speak up. Don't ever be afraid. Because if somebody's doing something wrong, they're gonna get in trouble for it. Mm -hmm. You know, if we have any issues at K&B, Greg and myself or Carrie Jones who runs the shop, there's, no, there's a zero tolerance, zero tolerance. And we have quite a few women that work at the shop. And, um, you know, I just, I just remind everybody to treat each other the way they wish to be treated and pretend you're talking to your mother, you know, or your, your sister. Sister. Sister, <laughs> mother. Sister, mother, mother, sister. Sister, mother, sister. Yeah, sister, uh, sister yeah. not your cool sister aunt. so much, because I was, really, <laughs> no, uh, I was yeah. really mean to my sister. I'm like, what are yeah. you doing, you morons? <laughs> um, but yeah, so with that, what, what Tammy's saying is, is true. You can't be... Listen, the world isn't, isn't set up for being a delicate flower in anything you do. I'm sorry. And that's the reality of the situation. Plus you know? just be the Yeah, be everyone the that's ever been on set, it's hard matter. work, right? You bust your ass. You work super hard. Guess what? It's going to be hard. But sometimes I'm on set and I'm shocked at what I hear makeup artists going, I'm just so tired, I didn't realize the hours are going to be this way. You're first in and last out, always. You're going to do, you're lucky if you do a 12-hour day. Yeah. Like, luxury, I dream of a 12-hour day. <laughs> luxury. Um, but it's, it's hard. But just be prepared for it. It's not going to be easy. You're going to, you know, you're going to work hard, no matter who you are. So, but it's interesting coming to schools, and I'm going to say, for the most part, it's all, it's all female, which is interesting. There's very few men uh, that seem to be getting into this industry now. Because they think they know it all. They, they think they know it all. But, um, <laughs> but no, I think it's great, you know, it's, it's, we, the industry is diversifying every single day. Like, I'm, I'm a governor at the Academy of Motion Pictures, and so we really work towards that, about, you know, under, uh, underappreciated people um, and, and uh, trying to get as much diversity in film and, um, and in every, every aspect. It's super, super important, you know. So, you know, if you have a plan, you have a dream, then you have to follow it and, and just work at it. But it's not going to come to you easy. It's just not going to be handed to you because you're this, this, or this. It doesn't work that way. You know, you, it's, it's hard. It's a hard job. But once you break in, it's great, you know? And it, uh, it's, it's very, very rewarding, I think. Any other questions? More things? I got a question. Okay, yes. Am I going to be able to put my glasses on? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yes, you will. So I can sign the book. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, you'll be, yeah, you can put them on. You Otherwise, it'll just have to be like a thumb. Oh, you'll be fine. Or next. Cool. Tammy, thank you so much for helping me apply the makeup. That was wonderful. Yeah, that was fun. Yay, Tammy. Cool Lynn. Cool. All right, now I'm going to do some coloring. Now, what I do like to do a lot is um, I normally would use Pax paint, but I'm not going to do that today. What I'm going to do is use these uh, rubber mask grease paint uh, palettes that Greg Cannon puts out. And I love a mix of things. Like, I'll, I, you're going to see I'm going to use this today, and then I'm going to use, you know, uh, some airbrush stuff and just a bunch of different things and some, you know, Viseart powders and so forth. So it's just kind of a big mix of things. And I think it all works great. We get so, again, so tied into, oh, well, I just, I can only use this, or I can only use that. And that's not at all how it works. You can use whatever you feel works best for the makeup. And so, yeah, this is just a rubber mask grease paint, just like we used to do on the good old days when Mike Deke and I worked on Day of the Dead for Tom Savini. We did everything in rubber mask grease paint, everything. And even now when I do makeups, be it foam rubber or silicone, I'll use the cosmetic makeups. I'll use a lot of MAC makeup, the, you know, the, um, the uh, silicone-based airbrush stuff. I love that. So I'll do a full makeup, and then I'll go ahead and 
after I've done any tattoo work or anything like that with some of the PBI stuff, I'll, um, I'll go in and hit it with nice soft splatter, what have you, of MAC makeup. So, yes? Uh, do you have a favorite kind of paint to use, or does it uh, determine with the lines? Uh, it's, you know what, I'm kind of, normally, like I said, I would do PAX paint. Just hit this with PAX, like the edges, and a little bit on Marshall's face. Um, I like to bring the piece into the actor. No, is that right? No, the actor into the piece. So I don't like to do like a ton of makeup. You know, like I wouldn't pack his entire face. I would just hit, hit little areas and so forth, almost like I'm doing here with this rubber mask. But I don't need to paint this right now. I'll just do that with the airbrush stuff. Um, so, I'm sorry, let me go back to answer your question. So, I'll use different things. I have a very distinct style, I think, of how I paint. Like, Tammy can always look at something like, oh, Howard painted that. Um, so, but I, I have, like, I always like to start with red. I do a base, and then I start with reds, and then I go into with browns and uh, red, uh, blues and things like that. and kind of just build up, and I like to do airbrush and then hand paint. So, I'll use the PPI stuff. Uh, I'll use the uh, EVA. I don't really, like, I'll mix it all up. And then the past, there's been companies that are like, oh, we want you to, you know, put your name on this, this, and this. I'm like, well, I don't exclusively use that. I use, like, 400 different products while I'm doing it, including straight makeup, you know, and beauty makeup, and, you know, so it's, it's whatever I want. Oh, no, Do you think uh, by using a bunch of different kinds of paints, it looks a little bit more realistic? I do, and I like using the rubber mask grease paint a lot, and um, because it, it has kind of a luster to it, you know, it doesn't feel plasticky. I sometimes think, like, the tattoo stuff. If you try to, I've seen make people like paint the entire thing with the tattoo colors, and there's like an elastomer in it, so it feels like it's real plasticky. It doesn't feel organic, but and also it's something great. Canem always talks about is using rubber mask grease paint. It could be on foam, silicone, whatever. I do it on silicone all the time. It works out really, really well. All right, that's good for now. Let's do some airbrushing. What do you say? So <clears throat> I know Tammy doesn't agree with me, but I love it. I always use a little tank. Tanks for the memories. Yeah. <laughs> I just envision that thing just blowing up. Listen, there's not going to blow up. Boom! <laughs> so, yeah, well, no. that size is fine. He shows up with the, you know. Don't be a baby. <laughs> True. No, I have a big, giant tank. And, yeah, it's like, this is just a small one, so I had to carry it around. And so I had oh, these. Wait, you had to carry it around. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> My knee hurt, okay? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that old chestnut. So anyhow, I have this one and I have a couple big big ones and they have these regulators on it, which I really like. I just don't like the noise of like the brrr, brrr, because when it says, oh, silent compressor, there's nothing silent about it. <laughs> <laughs> and actually it came about when we were doing Oz the Great and Powerful because we had like 30 makeup artists in one room and I didn't want to hear 30 brrr, brrr. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, we're getting tanks, and then I had this guy Michael Astalis make these um, these regulators. And what's cool is that you can fit two two uh, separate airbrushes in, and they have two different regulators. So, you know, I could change the flow of what I want, and Richie Alonso could change the flow of his one, what he wants. The big trick is you have to remember to turn it off at the end of the day or when you're done, as Richie would run out of tank every day. And he's like, I don't know, it just ran out. I'm like, get left it out all day. Because there's always like some sort of like slow leak. But I, I, like, I like this, I can regulate the air and all that good stuff. All right, let's do a little painting, shall we? Let's see, oh, capillary's nice. Cool, 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 let's see, what's that one? Oh, that's nice. Okay. Uh, this, this tank will go for a long, long time. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's sometimes I never even change the, change the tank through the course of the movie. Uh, it's a uh, poisonous gas. <laughs> it's, it's, whoops, it's CO2. Is that a dual action or is it? No, this is my very favorite. Crappy, <laughs> crappy ass, um, okay, 99% alcohol. Crappy ass uh, Pache. It's the airbrush, Not this is not the exact airbrush, but it's the same airbrush I used when I was a kid that my mom bought me for like Hanukkah. Every day I got a I got a piece of the airbrush. Oh, I got a cup. Oh, I got a I got a needle. I'm like someday I'll have a form. My mom didn't quite understand. I'm like, can I just have the whole goddamn airbrush, please? Is that what you use for your 
Yeah. No, I use this one. I love this one. Yeah. I mean, there's. I have a bunch of airbrushes, but this is really the one I like to use the most. Um, it's just simple and easy. And, and every time I drop it, it works better and better. I'm like, look, Tammy, I dropped this right on the needle. It's working great. Yeah, the splatter's great. So what I'm doing is I just kind of like, I just do like a little bit of a splatter, as you can see, or not see. Nazi. Nazi, what? Nice. That's racist. And I just kind of like, I don't know, I have a way of holding my airbrush down. And like my finger is, I don't put it on, I don't get like a tss, like that. I kind of have it in the crook of my finger. And I just kind of do it a little asymmetrically. I don't know, it just seems to work. Some people will take their, their tube and kind of crimp it. That's a Gino. Yeah, Gino does that. Gino Acevedo does that, he crimps it. Um, but I just kind of like airbrush it differently. I don't, this never gives me, this gives me too wide of a spray. And this just kind of gives me, you know, and hold it down so you have like right. centrifugal force. So then I just take a little, a little um, tissue. Whoops. <laughs> he's, he's used to that. <laughs> I take just like a little tissue to break it up and tap it down a little bit. And I'll do a couple layers on it and different, different colors and all that fun stuff. So let's see, you'll probably be able to see it better. The lighting's a little better on this side. And I just tap it down. And I add quite a bit of alcohol to the paint. I could have probably used a little more alcohol to this. That's how I feel. It smells good too. <laughs> and tastes great. You said you wanted to drink. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I just use a little 99% alcohol. <laughs> I'll just go a little bit broad. Actually, I could have probably watered this down way more. It's a little, it's a little, a little too heavy. But yeah, I like to just have really washy stuff. Uh, at least I'll have an excuse for spending an hour. <laughs> yeah, see, you're all good now. You can't see here and you'll be high when you sign your books. So. Yeah, exactly. And then you just kind of give it a spritz of alcohol in between. Clean out your airbrush a bit. Like a special, really tall cup. Yes. Yeah, I we made it at the shop because I, I'm the king of spilling. I'm like, I, yeah. So yeah, and you can also just take a tube, like a like a uh, like a just a plastic tube, and put it on and just cut it off, and you can extend it. I have like ones that are like that. It holds all the But yeah, the, I always find the cup is the cup is too small. Yeah, it's it's way too small, and uh, yeah, this is way better. All right, let's see. Aha. Uh -huh. We'll use next. Let's see, we got peak. Oh, I can use a little peak, I guess. Or not. Hello, T. Come on out. All right, let's see how this works. What's your favorite film you've worked on? My favorite film I've worked on is uh, The Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah? Yeah. That's my all time favorite film because it was like the best adventure ever. Um, it was really super fun. Uh, I felt like it was. Go ahead, Ouch. I felt like it was very similar to the book. It paralleled the book, the making of that movie, where we, you know, started off on Earth, and then we went, uh, we went through the wardrobe and ended up in Narnia, and we were in Narnia for almost a year, and it was exciting and fun. And then we came out and then we were sad and depressed. <laughs> and I wanted to go back to Narnia. And then, like two years later, we got to go back to Narnia. And, um, you know, I, I haven't had an experience like that since. Nar the Narnia films are really, really special to me. Um, I'm just saying, I'm going to throw out the tea because it's empty. Whose paints were these? Andy. Andy, I'll get you a new tea. <laughs> That's my favorite. Oh. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Hey, camera's ready. How much longer? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Don't make a meal out of it.
Did I do I say that? I do. Yeah. yeah. And you don't make a meal out of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Hold on a sec. Let's see this. <laughs> Yeah, Narnia was the, the most fun ever. Really was great. I'd love to go back in time, actually, and do it again. All right, this is just a little bit of rice paper. Ah, oh, the old rice paper guy. I love the rice paper. Yeah, I love the rice paper trick. Really ties the room together. So I kind of do this just to kind of go over it a little bit, just to tone everything down. Give a little bit of a scan there. You go. Oh, isn't that nice, Marshall? Sorry, did you say something? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot more comfortable than I thought it was going to be. Pretty close, right? Yeah, it's not too bad. No, all those crybaby actors we spoke to. Yeah, I know. <laughs> millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, seriously, where was my check? <laughs> hey Howard, when you were yeah. a kid, yeah. what was your favorite movie that you had to go see again and again? My favorite yeah. movie? Wow. That's... Like the one that like really, like even if when you were eight or 10 or whatever, you were just well, yeah, Jaws, of course, was, yeah. you know, where I, I know the answer, that, that, you know. Know. Yeah, Jaws was the big thing. But, um, but yeah, I loved movies. Like, I, I grew up here in L.A., so I was really lucky uh, in that sense. And my dad was in the film industry, and he worked uh, as a, a post-production sound editor. So I was exposed to film really early on. And we'd watch movies all the time, because he loved film so much. But I would see everything, you know. My dad, like, there was... I always think about like all the inappropriate movies I saw when I was too young to see them. I saw them all, you know, and I'm like, I really appreciate that now, you know. It's a super fun that I got to see it, and my parents didn't make a big deal of it. I remember we went, my parents took all of us, I have three sisters, took all of us to go see Saturday Night Fever when it opened. And because they thought, oh, John Travolta from Welcome Back, Cotter, there's dancing and music. Well, there's a lot of stuff in that movie that's not really for kids. <laughs> So I learned a lot. No, but my parents didn't make a big deal out of it. They didn't go like, oh my God, they just said the F word, or oh my God, this and that. They just, you know, we just saw the movie. And then we would see things all the time that really weren't age appropriate, but you know, it kind of helps feed you. Yeah, it's the 70s, free love, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Bunch of hippies. Uh, but no, it was great. It was, I felt really lucky to grow up during that time period when movies were really movies, you know? You think back, you know, I, there's, I mean, I go back and watch movies from the 60s and 70s all the time. They're my favorite. I think that's when filmmaking was at its all-time best. You know, now if you think about the movies that are coming out, yeah, you'll go see a Marvel movie, and you're like, yeah, that was super fun. But that's not a movie you're going to watch in 10 years, you know? Or you may not even see it again the second time, but, you know, you go see a movie like Bullet or Gone in 60 Seconds or, you know, Josie Wales. You're gonna watch that all the time. You know, those are real, real movies. You know, and it's it's the hard thing now because you know so much stuff is being run. The studios are being run by um, algorithms. You know, and they're like, well, we need to do this or that, or we need to have ten more of these sort of shows. And you're like, oh, can, how about we just do something cool? You know. So when we get on those sort of shows, I mean, we're lucky that we get to pick and choose those movies that we work on. But. Uh, you know, sometimes it's tough. Sometimes you're on a show and you're like, oh, I'm going to film myself. They're like, I'm going to work on this, but I'm never going to see it. <laughs> like, oh, did you see that movie? No, I'm good. I'm okay. Like, oh, don't you want to see that? It's so, it turned out so great. I'm like, or when you read in the paper, like, masterpiece. And I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> that, that word gets overused like crazy. Masterpiece. It was a masterpiece. Is there anything you feel is all about? Yes, The Godfather 1, <laughs> Jaws, Star Wars. Uh, what's that? No. <laughs> do you mean 03? Yeah, you mean yes, 03. I'm gonna, what, what do you think? You're a huge Star Wars fanatic. 
What was the question? Because all I can hear is like, Shh. yes, no. Uh, <laughs> what uh, um, are all Star Wars films uh, masterpieces? What are the masterpieces of Star Wars? Well, there was Star Wars, there was Empire Strikes Back, and don't say Star Wars Episode Four because it's like, no, when it first came out, it was Star Wars. When people say, what's your favorite film? I say, Star Wars. They go, which one? I say, it's Star Wars, <laughs> and Empire Strikes Back, and they Return of the Jedi, and then I'm pretty sure they stopped making Star Wars films. <laughs> <laughs> so, nothing else rings a bell. Yeah. So, oh God, that film changed my life, seeing that film. And you know, it's the sort of the phrase that people say, but really there was like me before Star Wars and, uh, and the freak that Star Wars created. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it changed a lot of people. Yeah. Lives, you know, I mean, when Star Wars came out, all of us like, were like, oh my God, those are the movies we want to work on, you know? It was really magical. It changed everything. It was so magical for me. My that was the year I, I was bar mitzvah, and I had a Star Wars themed bar mitzvah. <laughs> God, I wish I knew. Yeah, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of Star Wars merchandise out. So I think, like as I recall, there was like a, a couple magazines at the table, and then my friend Gene Omens made a Darth Vader costume, but he was like five foot five, so it's the smallest Darth Vader ever. Yeah. <laughs> but I was still enthralled. I'm like, oh my God, Darth Vader's in my bar mitzvah, and it's like. Hello, Darth Vader, it's so nice. Because <laughs> I stopped growing at 13 years old, so I've been six foot one since I was 13. Yeah, when Howard showed me the picture and he said this was my mitzvah, it's like, what, you so got a mitzvah when you were 30? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't yeah. make sense. Yeah, it's just when I started growing the beard, so. <laughs> Any other questions? Don't questions? laugh at me, I'm trying to help him. Oh, with, what? But I don't want to get into the... Oh, I feel like that. his feet are, if you don't mind, just... Oh. Oh, you want your things? Oh, there you go. Oh, look. Sorry. You okay. can put your foot down. Now. There you oh. go. Oh. Oh. oh, how well timed. <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> <laughs> what's the what big name actor or actress have you worked with that you were really excited about? Oh, what? What big actor that I've worked with? Let's see. Really, really excited. What are you showing? <laughs> oh, a Darth Vader and me and my bar mitzvah. Hey, listen, that was the happiest day of my life. Yeah, yeah, I think it's. So I think, you know, I've been lucky with actors. There's, I, lo I love working with actors. I, I have to say like out of all the actors, I've worked with thousands of them. There's only like two that I would prefer never to work with again. But, <laughs> but out of that, I mean, there's, that's a lot of actors. My favorite actors so far, God, they're all great. But, you know, as far as big names go, Anthony Hopkins was outstanding. James McAvoy was fantastic. And, but we, we worked with James before James was famous, you know? So it, he was so not famous, they didn't even pick him up on Narnia from the airport, so I went and picked him up. I was like, hey, can you go out and pick James McAvoy up? I think he comes in today, into New Zealand, all the way from London. And Howard pushed for James to be cast. Yeah. It's true, when, Jay, when they weren't sure who Mr. Thomas was gonna be, and they had flown James secretly to LA, because he was working on the show Shameless. Like, you know, there's an American version, there's a British version, yeah. And so he flew in, he got off set, he wasn't supposed to leave because he had to be back on set on Monday. So he flew in, came to the shop, we had six hours with him, did his life cast photos, we had made a bunch of mock-up stuff, and like, including like Mr. Tundas' legs, and we put him in a chair, and he was like in a hole through the chair, and we did all this stuff, and you know, James really brought it to life, and when he, you know, then he hopped a plane, flew home, went right from the airport straight to set. So nobody ever knew James left the UK. <laughs> and I called the producers. I already sent an email, and I just went, I just want to say that this guy is Mr. Tungus. Like, there's nobody better. If we don't cast him, this movie's going to suck. <laughs> and they cast James, you know, and it was, it was great. It was great. But yeah, I've been really lucky. At, you know, great actors, really fun actors, actors that you know you, you get along with. Some actors that stay your your friends. That that's another thing too. Like we're friends with actors, but we're not friends with actors. 
and that's a dangerous line to cross when you're when you're a professional right first off they're not your friends they'll never be your friends all right because they're they're insecure and have egos and need automatic gratification you love them to no end and you're there but you're not like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna uh, you know, give Tony Hopkins a call. Not that Tony's any of those, by the way. But I'm just saying like, hey Tony, what are you doing? Wanna hang out? Let's go, you know. It's not how it works. When you're on a show, you're friendly with the actor. You're there to help the actor you know, go through the process and be there for him. But don't like, hey, let's all go out to dinner. Don't mix the two things. It's very, very dangerous. And I've certainly listened to makeup artists who are sitting there saying, oh yeah, you know, we're, I'm gonna do their next movie and all this shit. You're not, that's all bullshit and you're not gonna do the next movie because they're not with the power to hire you usually. And you know, even working with big actors, like Leonard has, has had a lot of work with as a personal. I've had a lot of work with personals, but I keep my distance, you know? And I do my job, and I'm friendly with them, they're friendly with me, I mean, we like each other, but we don't go to dinner. I think like, the, you know, I worked with Mark Wahlberg for like nine years solid, and I think in that time I had dinner with him twice. And once was he brought food into the trailer. He was like, hey, I brought this for you. I'm like, thanks, you gonna eat? I'm good. Can't eat, gotta go to bed. It's, it's uh, you know, 4 p.m. <laughs> I gotta get up in four hours to work out. So, but uh, you know, you just, you gotta be really careful. That's something that's super important. And when you're in the makeup trailer, don't have like rag mags or any of that shit around. Because sometimes, you will you may have a people magazine in there and there might be something that your actor is in that magazine and that's a, a big trigger so just and keep it quiet in the trailer you don't need to be blaring music and it's not about the you're being individual you know you're there working as a team follow the lead of the department head that's really really important you know you're representing you're de representing the department head and you're representing your profession okay so it's like, when you go to set, you listen and learn, look at the monitor, just listen. You know, it's not a, it's not social hour. It's not like a, a you know, you all sit around in a circle and yammer, yammer, yammer. The good thing, one of the good things about the co after post COVID is less people on set. It used to be like, we'd go to set and like 400 people and you're like, oh my God, what are all these people doing here? No, I'm like, you and you and you, and we'll switch people out. And then like, okay, lunchtime. Okay, Andy go to set and so-and-so go to set. And that's great. And. Um, Half the time you end up staying at the makeup station. Like when you, you just did a show, right? You went in for a couple of days, not recently, but with James James McCannon. Yeah. And you guys were just staying on stage, right? Yeah, we were yeah. on stage. So so yeah, it works out really well. And you just you know, you gotta be there. It's not about like, oh they didn't ask me to go to set, I feel bad, da da da. There's a there's a reason for everything. It's it's bigger than you. And things domino. So, you know, just listen to what your department head says. They they know usually what they're doing. And uh, you know, go from there. You know everybody's still waiting for you to say about the two actors that you hate, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hate them. I'd just rather not see them ever again on Earth. <laughs> if, let's say if I heard, like, oh, did you hear so-and-so died? I'm like, ah, well, well. Well, I'm going to the funeral to make sure they're dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, have all my plans of revenge. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, they're a tricky bunch, actors, but they're great. They're, I mean, they can be great. They can be wonderful and fun to work with, but just always keep in mind. You know, they'll, they'll throw you under the bus sometimes, too. Wow, I was in makeup this whole time. I'm like, no, you were not. You were in the bathroom. That's why we were radios. That's why, yeah, and that's the thing. We were radios. Cammy and I were radios, walkie talkies. Whoops. So, you can, so we can hear everything. We hear everything, and they know we do, but they forget. So if they're talking shit about us, I'm like, uh, "Hey guys, thanks for that info." <laughs> yeah. Always listening, always listening in, and always answering, and helping the AD department. A lot of the times, you know, we'll be there, and we're we're helping move it along, you know, because you know, in, in the base game, you got a poor B, base camp PA. What are they gonna do? You know, there's times Cammy and I'll go to the trailer, knock on the actor's trailer, like, "Listen, why is he in that trailer so long?" Da 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 da. I'm like. Ugh, can I just get this makeup done already? And I'll go knock on the trailer. I'm like, hey, I'm waiting for whenever you're ready. I'm wait, I'm ready for you. Oh, I didn't realize nobody came to tell me. I'm like, okay, well, I'm telling you, now it's time to come to the trailer. And let's get our job done. And then we can go, I'll just get home sooner if you come to the makeup trailer. So yeah. And of course I know they've been told a hundred times, but they're like, I don't even know what they do in there. There's like these little cramped rooms. I'm like, what are these guys doing in here? It's not fun in here, is it? But they seem to like sit in there, right? Oh yeah, sorry, I was just getting ready. I'm like, 
Come on. <laughs> chop, chop. Yeah, it's craziness. It's craziness. Oops. Almost done, guys. Because um, Cam needs this on set immediately. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Um, any other questions? Anybody? Yes. Say, of, of, of Spy Kids, yeah. You were on Spy Kids, weren't you? Didn't you work on Spy Kids with us? Yeah, in the shop, right. And also Scream. Uh huh. Yeah. Do you want to know about all those? I'll tell you about those. <laughs> all right, so Spy Kids. Spy Kids, when we all worked on it, we thought it was going to be the lamest thing ever. We hated every design, right? And everybody, like Norman Cabrera, is like, I refuse to sculpt that. This is a piece of shit design. <laughs> and we just kind of went for it. And, and we just did what Robert Rodriguez wanted to. And even though we were like, oh, this is going to be so bad. This is so lame. Da, da, da. And then we went to see the movie. And we're like, hey, you know what? This movie's really, really good. <laughs> it's really fun. And then we were like, wow, we were wrong. And I think like Shannon and, and, and Norman played little fungi, the fungals or whatever, yeah. those, you know, those weird kind of things. And then uh, we had the thumb thumbs and yeah, the thumb thumbs were all suits. Yeah, the big thumb thumbs were all suits and all that. And uh, yeah, no, it, it actually ended up, it, I mean, we were all like bad mouthing it when we were working on it. Like this is a piece of shit. Um, and it's like Robert's lost his mind. Okay, that's still gone now this. And um, yeah, we just didn't buy it. And then, uh, and then regarding Scream, well, oops, sorry. Um, I got that script and I hated it more than anything. I hated the script. I thought it was a, the worst, one of the worst scripts I ever read. And, and I kid you not, I threw it across my office four times against the wall. I'm like, this is the worst rip-off crap I've ever read. Because I felt like it was just a rip-off. It was, Kevin Williamson wrote it. And I'm like, he just ripped off everything we've ever worked on. I don't understand. And then like I could it just wasn't connecting with me and I was supervising it. And when it came to the mask, I couldn't figure it out. So we had a guy named John Bisson. We're draw, doing all these drawings and I'd go to the production office, I go see Wes, and he's like, nope, not it, not it. I'm like, well, what is it you want? I don't really know. I'll know when I see it. I'm like, that's not telling me anything. And I brought we did like 40, 50 drawings of the, you know, what this mask looks like. And um, anyhow, finally ready to shoot this show. It's shooting uh, mostly all nights in San Jose. I went up there, I was miserable the whole show. Hated it, never went to set, like stayed in my trailer as much as possible until I had to go do something. And I think I alternated with another guy, Bill Hunt. Um, and Bill went and did stuff and then I'd go back and forth and I'm like, I fucking hate this movie. And I did the whole end of the movie, all that stuff. But the thing about the mask is that Wes was scouting location scouting and was taking photos and then we got the photos back there was that screen mask on a wall and he's like that's it but we have to like remake it because we don't own the we don't own the rights to it so Bob Kurtzman who at that time was the K and K and B sculpted like five versions of it there's five different versions of that mask in screen one all different and uh, and it kept changing because uh, kept asking for different things like oh it should be like this it should be like that you know and no it has a longer chin or a shorter chin or bigger brows so the, all those masks are in Scream 1 and then at the end of Scream 1 they just reached out to the mask making company like oh yeah here's a whole you know three boxes of them knock yourselves out I'm like oh my god <laughs> so the rest of the movies was the the manufactured mask um, and uh, but in, in the first one there's like five versions of that mask but, I, but then I went to see the movie going like, this is going to be such shit. And actually I was standing on set and it was the night we killed Rose McGowan's character with the, when she gets crushed. And I looked at Wes and I was like, oh God. And he went, yeah, this is the last nail in my coffin. I'm done after. I'm like, there's no one's going to hire me to ever direct again. Because we had just done Vampire in Brooklyn, which bombed. And then we had done another movie that bombed. It was like four movies in a row that just bombed with Wes. He's like, this will be the last one I ever direct. They're never going to give me a job. Like, maybe I'll do a mayonnaise commercial. <laughs> and the movie came out and, like, had a kind of, it came out right at Christmas. It was December 21st. And I'm like, what idiots would release a horror movie December 21st? <laughs> Anyhow, it had a pretty good weekend. And then it grew and grew and grew. The movie ended up making, like, a billion dollars. And I'm like, I'm glad they didn't ask me about it. Like, should we make this movie? No way! You know? <laughs> and then, you know, you look and now look at how many, what is it, 27 other screen movies made? <laughs> Some shit like that. Um, 
Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So you ne so there, you never know. I mean, all of us have worked on films where like, this is gonna be so great, and then you go see it and you're like, oh, mama mia. And then there's movies where you see it and you're like, you know, you think it's gonna be the worst thing ever. And you're like, wow, that turned out really, really great. So surprised. So you, you truly never know. You have no clue whatsoever how things are gonna be here. I don't know. Most it all sounds so random. Yes, it is. It is random. You never know. Basically, rule of thumb, if you have a terrible time on a movie, it's yeah. going to be a hit. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, if you're sitting like, you know, in every production meeting, always starts the same. And then you, you like, if they, if they say this, you know you're going to be in trouble. And we say, we've got a great script, great cast, we're going to have fun. And, you, and I look at Tammy, I'm like, this is going to be a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have this is gonna be great. They're gonna, you know, really great director. And I'm like, this guy. <laughs> so I'm gonna use a little busy art eyeshadow stuff. Eyeshadow stuff. I started using this a long time ago. Actually, on Kill Bill. I really, really like it a lot. And I was doing the Dirt Girl on Uma Thurman, which was like one of my most scariest makeups I've ever done because I'm. Quentin's like, just go do her makeup. And I'm like, it's Uma Thurman. <laughs> He's like, just whatever, just go for it. And I'm like, it's Uma Thurman. <laughs> and I walk in, I'm like, hey, Uma, I'm going to do this. She's like, yeah, do whatever you want. And I just like did her makeup all in the, just with this palette and then, you know, put more dirt on her. But she didn't want to be powdered down with dirt because obviously it was a bit of a carcinogenic. Um, so, but yeah, it was really, but I was so nervous the first time because I'm like, you want me to do a makeup on Uma Thurman? <laughs> Hi, have we met? <laughs> so, but it worked out great. It was fun. And that's it, you know, that's the thing too. I, I, I get really nervous before movies. Like, when, my first day, I'm very nervous. Because I don't sleep the night before. Um, I'm confident in what I'm doing. But that doesn't mean like, I'm like, oh yeah, it's great. I find that being overconfident, will, you will foil yourself. Um, if you just kind of like, okay, I, I know I can do this, but you're really, paying attention and you really don't go in like oh yeah I got this because I've done that and it has been the fail of all fails like you don't know what failure is till you're standing in South Dakota with a bunch of mechanical buffalo in front of Kevin Costner and nothing's working because you're like oh yeah we already did this on Dance with Wolves and you're like the rest of the time you're standing out there throwing rocks at a raging buffalo in the hopes he will kill you so your body can be flown back to LA and you're off the movie <laughs> Yeah, I was with my friend Shannon Shea, and like we shot video, and I was watching it recently. I'm like, we're on the plane laughing, I'm like, yeah, hoo -hoo, having a great time. And then we're in, the, in our hotel room laughing, and then we're first day, I'm like, here we are, and we're panning around, and there's all the mechanical buffalo. And then no more video. And then the next video is the last, and we're in our hotel, and I'm like, well, <laughs> that didn't go well. And Shannon, you know, Shannon, you know, just like, ah. Yeah. Oh God! <laughs> I'm like, okay, shut it off. And I was, and I'm like, never again will I ever be overly confident. I'll be, I'll feel confident. like, okay, I, I can do this. I'll be okay. But I'm always nervous day one. Always nervous, or always nervous when I do a makeup for the first time. Like I know I can do it. You know, I've got good people with me that I'm doing it with. But I still get nervous. You know, because it's not. I can, it's, it could be a total disaster. Which that's okay too. If you screw it up, you can just go back and fix it. You know, there's always a way to remedy it, and that's the thing too. Uh, just, uh, just admit your mistakes and go with it. And there's a way to remedy it. And failure, I know I say this all the time as well, but you will learn from failure. Okay, not you're gonna fail, guys. You're all gonna fail. I fail often. I might have just failed right now. Matter of fact, I like it in my pants. So, but. But you know, you're gonna, you're gonna fail, and that's okay, because you're only gonna learn from failure. You know, you're not gonna learn from succeeding, because then you're like, oh yeah, that worked great, I can do that every time. No, that's not true at all. You can't do it every time. So it's okay to make a mistake and, and just go, okay. And you don't sit there and blame, like, well, the reason was, the reason was I hate excuses more than anything, I hate it. And it's just like, okay, let's talk about how we're gonna remedy it, you know? And on Kill Bill, speaking of which, I, I really fucked up, a gag. And it was something that I thought I, like, I was confident. It was a scene in House of Blue Leaves, and one of the guys falls into this big thing of water with koi fish, and Quentin wanted like a big cloud of blood rising up. It's in the movie. I finally figured it out. But I was with a guy, Chris Nelson, was with me and Jake McKinnon, not James McKinnon, but Jane, Jake Pickles McKinnon, Pickles. 
And um, it was just the three of us doing everything on Kill Bill in China. And so I was like, okay, so I rigged up this big uh, blood like uh, uh, fire extinguisher and I tested it in the water and it worked. But then on the day, you know, with the camera rigs and we spent hours getting it ready. And when I hit the blood, bubbles came up because it was compressed air. And Quentin was not happy, threw a shit on me, like really laid it out. And I just sat there and I understand, I'm sorry. And I felt really, really horrible because I let him down. I didn't feel bad because I, I mean, I felt bad, but it wasn't because like, oh no, I, I let myself, I let him down, somebody I respect and, and care about. And I said, okay, I, I'll figure this out. So he's like, you better figure this out, man, because this is a big fuck up, da 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 I was so upset. Anyhow, I thought about it and thought about it. I'm talking to Jake and talking to Chris, and I'm like, you know what? This has to do with, with centrifugal force. I'm pumping the blood out, but we need to just let it go. So we found a gigantic tube, which we ran, and we got a big ladder. Pickles got on top of it. We brought the ladder down and hooked it to the back of the actor's back, strapped it. He was laying in the water, or his front rather, he's laying face down, I think. No, no, face up, we strapped to his back. And then Jake was up there with 10 gallons of blood, poured it down the tube, came down, and just went and clouded. And Quentin's like, that's it, that's it, that we're fucking, this was like a week later, you know, because it took me about a week to find everything. And afterwards he said, you know what, you didn't, you never said any excuses. You just said, I will solve this problem. I'll, I will rectify this. And I did. And he was very thankful. And I remember that stays with me, him saying, you know, somebody else would have like had 500 excuses or pulled the friend card, but you didn't. You said, we're going we're gonna to make this work and I'll, I'll figure it out. But yes, but out of failure, we came out with something that was 10 times better and really simple. Sometimes the, the, the simplest thing works the best. You know, sometimes you think like, oh, we got to do this rig and this, like, tie a rope to it and pull it out of the frame. That works out fucking great. So, <laughs> you know, I've been in those situations too. I see, see like Peter Chesney would always like overbuild this big effects guy. And we had like, had this dog for interview, or um, Vampire in Brooklyn. And the dog is supposed to shoot up in the air. And he built this crane and all this. And I'm like, just tie a goddamn rope to it. <laughs> and that's what they ended up doing. Tie, I'm like, Wes, tie a rope to it and just pull it up. That's what we did, and I'm like, okay, well, that was money well spent for that giant crane. <laughs> so, pretty silly shit. But you just kind of figure stuff out, and you go around, and you, you're like, okay, how do we get this done? And it's brainstorming. We all brainstormed and tried to figure out the best possible way to do this. You know, and, and it's like, I, I don't know everything. Even when I'm in the shop, I'm, I'm sitting there going, hey guys, we got this gag, and da 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 I mean, what do you, what do you guys think? What do you, how can we make this work? I'm just about done. Um, and, and we'll all brainstorm it and, and come up with stuff. Like Mike Peek, who's here, who's been around doing this as long as I have, Mike has uh, great ideas and knows how to figure shit out on the spur of the moment. I mean, there's times I've been on set with Mike and he literally is just like, no, 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 we'll do it this way, this way, this way. And it's like, it's so, it's right there in front of our faces. Low tech and it works better than anything, anything. And so what you have to do, it just because it's new or, you know, cost of this much or that much doesn't mean that's the way to go. You can really get away with so much. You um, can reset too. Yeah, you can reset, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, and there's just a bunch of different things you can do and just make it easy on yourself. It's hard enough, you know, they, they make it hard enough. I mean, I think like my friend Jerry Quist, who's a big makeup artist, he said something recently that I now have stolen and he said, I love what I do, but I hate what they do. And, and it's true, you know, you get frustrated. It's like, listen, I know what I'm doing. So just let me do my thing, you know. Tell me what you want and I'll make it really cool. Just don't, don't bug me. Don't, you go over there and figure out what's not a craft service today, so. Okay, Mr. Director. <laughs> so, all right, yeah. we'll leave it at that. I'm sure I could do a hundred other things, but Tammy says it needs to get to set. Immediately, Seth is ready to shoot. Um, well, okay. your glasses take it off. Yeah. Oh yeah, here they are. These are your glasses? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't need to see. Um cool. What other questions? Anybody anybody else have questions? Yes. Working on Evil Dead 2, it was really, really fun. But it was really, really hot. Because it was Wadesboro, North Carolina, which uh, this was in 1980, 
six, but it might as well have been 1886 there. <laughs> it was pretty wacky, I'll tell you that much. And, um, but we had a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. We got to build everything. I was in charge of all Bruce Campbell's stuff, and Shannon Shea, this other guy, Shannon Shea, did Evil Ed. Kurtzman did all the uh, Linda stuff. Mike Tursick worked on that. Mark Showstrom, who we worked for, he was in charge of the show. He did Henrietta and the Pee Wee Head. And uh, Greg coordinated the entire show, Greg Nicotero. And uh, Aaron Sims, who's now a, like a giant uh, um, designer, was kind of a shop, shop guy, just helping clean stuff up, and he sculpted the Pee Wee neck. And, uh, and Greg Nicotero sculpted the evil hand, and he was the evil hand. Greg was the evil hand. And um, yeah, and the floorboard's doing this. And we had the stump coming off. And uh, it was super fun. I had a great time. We all lived in one house. We called it the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house, and it was. It was the same construction as, Chex as the Chainsaw House. And in the back was a barn, dilapidated barn, which we called Friday the 13th Barn, because it looks like from, from Friday the 13th Part 3D or whatever. And we're like, I know Jason's back there. And then there was a creek, or like this walkway that went to a lagoon. And I'm like, that's the creature from the Black Lagoon. So we really had like, we lived on a horror plantation. And, uh, and it was so bloody hot, and I remember Kurtzman, Nicotero, and myself were upstairs, and Mark Showstrom and Mike Tursick were downstairs. So <coughs> there was no, the house was over 100 years old, no air conditioning. We were just sweating. So Greg and I went to the store, we bought like little portable fans, and we screwed them to the, all around the beds. So we just lie there and be like, Rrr! but before we went to bed, we would take our, our uh, we filled the bathtub with water and ice, we'd take our bed sheets, Put them in there and just lay them down. We walk back and lay down with them and just lay there all night and, and just sweat like pigs. But that's probably not the part of the movie you want to know. Um, <laughs> but working on it was super fun. Again, we didn't know what we were doing. And, you know, I'd sit there and I'm like watching Sam Raimi being dragged with a camera between his legs on a on a blanket, and I'm like, what is this guy doing? How's this going to be any good? Of course, we had a blast, and Sam wanted us to do crazy shit. And then when we saw the movie, we were like, oh, that's what he was doing, you know? But it was very much like a bunch of kids making a movie, you know? And then in downtime, we would make our own movies, because we always used to do that, and we'd find time to like make little, little movies, and we did like Reanimator Baby. Like we went and bought this fake doll, and we were playing around with it, and we, it was, we, went to, we had one day off a week. We shot six days a week, so Sunday was our day off. And we wanted some civilization, so we'd go drive to Charleston. Uh, for the day. And we'd always stop at Toys R Us and we bought all these like squirt guns. So we had like a million water squirt guns. But we bought this baby doll. And that baby doll ended up being, you know, a great set, source of uh, fun and excitement. And I remember the first day we got it, we tied a rope to the leg and Mark Showstrom was in the front seat, in the passenger seat, and Greg was driving. And Mark was like, oh, and when a car drove up, he'd be like, oh, nice baby, oh no! And, the baby would come up, and we'd just pull it back in, you know? <laughs> So we did one gag where Mark wanted to like, for some reason, we took a hose and we filled it all the way up with green pea soup. And then we did like a, a vomit thing. And Mark's like, oh, hi, cute little baby. We had the baby sitting there. And then we turned, <laughs> turned on the water and fucking green pea soup comes out and knocked the head off. And so we're all laughing. And we're like, wait a minute, we can do a reanimator baby movie. And then Bob Kurtzman played Herbert uh, West. And so we did the whole thing and the baby comes back to life and kills, runs around. Meanwhile, they're shooting the movie and these idiots are running around. That's the thing also about like early makeup effects. Like when Mikey and I worked on Day of the Dead with Tom Savini, we're all there to work, but Savini's there to goof off, you know? So like we all had, or that each department had golf carts, but when they were shooting, nobody was using their golf cart. So Tom's like, let's everybody grab a golf cart. And we'd go in and we were shooting this 175 or 125 mile limestone mine underground. And you know, somebody grab a boom box and we'd put the Raiders Lost Ark music on and we'd be driving through. And during the winter when we were shooting, people stored their expensive cars and boats down there. And we're running into everything. Bam, bam, I think Mike Tursick <laughs> ran, drove through a boat. <laughs> And, but Savini was like the instigator of all this, you know? And he's the guy, it's like, are you supposed, you're the grown up, you know? I, I'm 18, you're 45. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. And like, yeah, Tursic drove through a boat, it probably was like a million dollar boat, and I'm like, oh no, what are you gonna do? And Tom's like, let's just go, go, everybody go. <laughs> it's like, just ignore it, it never happened. If they didn't see it, it never happened. I'm like, okay, sounds we never good. Got yeah, we never got caught. Yeah, it's fine. We, nobody got a bill, you know? <laughs> 
So, but those movies were super fun. And we weren't making any money whatsoever. Like on Day of the Dead, I know I made 300 a week. I was an intern. You were an intern, so you were, <laughs> you, you were getting paid with experience. Yeah. Nick, Nick, Greg was making $145 a week. And, uh, and then, um, yeah, it was crazy. And then on Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, I think I was making maybe $450 a week flat, you know, and it was six days a week, you know. We weren't union then, of course. We were just a bunch of goofballs, you know, doing monsters and makeup and all this crazy stuff and running around the woods at night, you know, putting in everybody's contact. Greg was putting lenses in everyone in the middle of a forest. I'm like, that's safe, you know. <laughs> but what did we, we didn't know anything, so it was pretty crazy. Um, let me take, like, another question, and I think what we're going to do is... Uh, I think we're going to start signing books, if that's cool with you guys. So, uh, any other questions? And you can ask us questions while we're signing books. Um, any other questions, guys, about anything? Anything? Orange whip? Orange whip? Three orange whips? No? 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 Nothing? Yes, yes. Uh, I actually did him for four, and it, and it was great. And Robert's like one of the nicest guys on earth, and he's in the book, matter of fact, right? And Robert is just a really super nice guy. Like the first time I did that makeup, you can get up if you want to wander around and have fun. Or you can yeah. stay right here, as you should. Whoops. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll uh, just stay here. All right, you sit right there. So on the first day I did it, I was working for Kevin Yeager. And um, Kevin's like, yeah, just, you know, this is how you do it. And it's a multi-piece makeup. So I pre-painted everything. And it took me four and a half hours the very first day. And it's because I was, I was respecting Robert, because Robert talks incessantly. So every time he'd talk, I'd just wait, you know, and then I'd do it. And then he'd talk and wait. So, and I told Kevin, and Kevin was like, dude, just do it. Ignore him. He'll talk forever. Just grab his head like this and do it. Uh, so for, for, first day was four and a half hours. Last day was 45 minutes. And literally, there, I would grab Robert like this and just make him up. And he would just be talking to people. Blah, 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 blah. And one time I did it, I'm like, okay, you're done. He's like, you didn't do the lips. I'm like, dude, I did the lips. When? Oh, when you were telling your story about Susan Sarandon's sister. That's what I did. Oh, I don't know. What about the hand? I'm like, look at your hand. Oh, when did you do that? Well, when you were telling the story about when you were. And he just, because he loves an audience. Robert loves an audience. But he is the nicest, kindest, sweetest guy. There was one day on set, because like after I did the makeup, I take a little water and KY jelly to give him that kind of greasy look. And so Robert was like running away from me all day long. And I'm like, what the hell? I got to do touch up. And I'm like, Robert. And he's like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm like, what's going on? End of the night, I'm going to clean him up. And I see there's a bunch of tissue paper all over his face. And I'm like, what, what happened? He's like, oh, I sneezed and I blew my nose and it all stuck. And I didn't want you to get mad at me. I said, dude, that comes off with water on a sponge. <laughs> so all day long, you've been running, hiding from me. And I'm like, I'm fine. Go away. You know, there was, we were shooting those movies. They have a release date before they ever have a script. So it's like, this movie comes out August 23rd and it's July 15th. And I'm like, oh boy. And like, they'd shoot it in Santa Clarita. We'd be shooting seven days a week, 25 units. So we were all exhausted. So they got us these hotel rooms right off of the five freeway, like at Magic Mountain, it was a thing. Anyhow, we, Robin and I go and we crash there and then get up and go to work. And then the next night we come back, we get different rooms. And I go into the shower and I look down and there's Freddie's ear on the, in the shower. And I'm like, wow, they don't clean this place very well. And I had Robert's, I had Robert's room and he just ran out the door. He's like, I'll take it off at home. <laughs> and so he cleaned them. So, like, so there was a foam rubber Freddie ear in the shower. As I walked in, I'm like, oh God, this is going to be a nightmare. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to sleep in here if Robert was in here. So, but yeah, crazy stuff like that. The 80s were a different time, you know? It was, uh, it was crazy, 70s and 80s, you know. But like I said, I started, I got out of high school. I worked for a little bit for John Beakley, and I worked for Stan Winston for a long time, and, and that was great. And um, yeah, six years, I worked for people for six years prior to starting K&B with Greg, which was in uh, February of uh, 1988. So it's funny, I, I, um, my wife always asks me, she's my second wife, and she's a little younger than me. And she's like, so when you did, you know, Evil Dead, how, how old were, how, I, or when was that? I said, you were six. When you did this, I base everything on age. Like, so when you started KB, you were eight, you just turned eight years old. So, anyhow, she's not young like that anymore. So, which is good. So, um, all right. Well, listen, guys. Thank you for listening and coming. And I think I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna sign. Where are we signing?
Okay, great. And, and if, if this is possible, because you know, aside from just getting us two knucklehead signatures, there's two other people here that have contributed to the book, which is Leonard Engelman, and also Tammy Lane, if you guys are interested in signing with us. Leonard, are you up for that task? Or, yep, Leonard is ready. And Tammy, you good? Tammy said no. Tammy said 15 bucks an autograph, so is there a way we can negotiate that? Yeah. Great. So we'll put the table here and we're just going to sit here? Yeah. All right, let's do that. So guys, thank you. If you have other questions, please come and ask us. And Marshall's here. I'm here. Good. I know. I want to have a look.